everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, the content executive of Higher Things, and David Zills, the apologist, is back. David, how you been? I'm doing all right. Um, I got my blueberry cinnamon crumble coffee today, so, you know, things could be a lot worse. That, that, there, there is, I'm at war now because that sounds delicious, even though I, I don't want to acknowledge, it sounds delicious, I want to try that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, pumpkin spice season is about over, so gotta, gotta get into something else. You gotta move on to something else. You know, <laughs> I'm about blueberries, like that, that is, that is the fruit that does it for me. Um, so, yeah, no, all right, uh, I'm distracted now, let's talk about something. <laughs> okay. I just think about that the rest of the day. Yeah. What are we doing? Yeah, so um, we talked about miracles last time, and it seems that when you talk about miracles, there's kind of, you know, a number of reactions you can get from people. There's that, well, I live in an age of science, so, you know, that stuff doesn't happen. You know, we, we can prove everything with science. We can test everything. And anytime you test a miracle, there ends up being a natural explanation. And that's, I think that's actually true in a lot of cases. And you can have the other reaction, which is, oh my goodness, miracles are everywhere. Everything is a miracle. Life is a miracle. Babies are miracles. And you kind of, you know, there's some fuzziness with the language of, well, what do we mean by miracle? Do we mean everyday things and you just need to see it through the eyes of a child? Or are we talking about things that are actually extraordinary that don't happen and that are we have that we can make a case that God intervened in the normal course of events? So last time we argued for a definition of the latter, which we're not talking about like seeing everything as a miracle, because if everything's a miracle, then nothing's a miracle. I mean, there's something to be said for seeing creation and the created order with wonder and appreciating God's creation. But when you're talking about philosophy, we have to be careful with our terms. So we're talking about things that are not normal that God does um, to get our attention. Um but, you know, people will say, oh, well, those happen all the time. Look all over the Internet. There's that guy who went to heaven, that kid who went to heaven and came back and told all these stories and talked about how heaven is real. And then, oh, wait, he made it all up. And so, you know, there's a lot of hoaxes out there, too, and lots of people who will do stuff and try to get attention and maybe make money. I mean, obviously, yeah. that's an incentive. And so there's this whole plethora of stuff. So when we approach the topic of miracles, we got plenty of reason to be skeptical. We've got science, we've got people who are outright frauds, um, all this stuff. And so then the question is, you know, when we see miracles in the Bible, well, clearly, that's a fairy tale, right? And so this is important, because, you know, a lot of modern quote unquote, theological scholarship has looked at the Bible and said, we need to look at it through a scientific lens, which, you know, they take to mean if it's supernatural, it's a fairy tale. And, you know, then the resurrection goes out, then, you know, all this stuff that pretty much makes the Bible what it is, is out. And you just are left with a book of moral teachings. And honestly, Christianity is interesting as a book of moral teachings, because it has some really high standards and it talks about hard issues and not just behavior. But lots of people have had those insights. And so if we're just looking at a book of moral teachings, then there's nothing really special about Christianity or Jesus. And so we have to confront these miracles. And when you do that today, there's just going to be skepticism. And it's understandable. There are good reasons for that. Right. I, I even sort of struggle myself with it as, as a pastor. I remember in the parish, um, one of the things that, that sort of the conversation about them was, I know they did happen. The scriptures, they, they don't lie to us. Christ is risen from the dead. There were miracles. And I know that miracles can happen um, because this, the God who was still is. And so Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. But to expect them is one of those things I always wanted to sort of put the brakes on because I know that he can do them, but I don't know that he necessarily will to them. He has promised to forgive my sins in the word and the sacraments. And I know that he does do miracles, but they, they happen according to his will and not sort of according to ours. And they, they happen, um, not, not sort of, um, for everyone. And that, that makes it challenging because if you want to pin your faith on seeing a miracle, you might go empty, but at the same time, you don't want to dismiss the fact that there can be. And so when you look at them, how can you say, well, my faith can be strengthened by the fact that God clearly did something here. There's a, there's a balance to be walked. And I think sort of actually addressing, whether or not miracles are still happening today, it, it's important, uh, not, not to sort of teach you to expect them in your own life, but to, to recognize that the God who was still is. 
Yeah, so yeah, you brought up a number of points. I mean, there's there's the theology of do miracles still happen? There's the theology of what's the role of miracles in my personal faith? Lots of things there. But one thing I want to latch on to is what you said is it's important to ask, are these things happening today? Because, you know, last time we talked kind of about the philosophy, it was maybe dry and abstract. We talked about did miracles happen and can miracles happen but then you kind of brought up this other point of do miracles happen and the reason that's important is um, it's not essential because we don't need to see them today to believe they happened before but there's this idea in philosophy called the principle of analogy and it basically means it's hard to believe things happen in the past if we don't see analogies or similar things happening today. So this is pretty intuitive. You know, if Tacitus wrote in the first or second century that Julius Caesar could fly, we would be skeptical because we don't see analogies, similar things happening today. People don't fly. And as far as we know, nobody ever has. So that would be weird. Um, and so we'd be skeptical. And so there's this um, there's this other idea when you're testing hypotheses, when you're looking at historical data, there's a criterion called plausibility, which is basically, is this something that's known to happen? And so the principle of analogy kind of tells us, you know, kind of a common sense check of is this is this plausible? Is this something that could happen? And so that's kind of where this this motivates the um, the skepticism toward miracles, because if we don't see these things happening today, then they're likely to be fairy tales in the past. That's how, that's how the argument goes. Right, and that's not even an, an unfair thing to sort of hold Christianity to that standard either, to, to say to say in the same way that if, if everybody told me that that um, that Caesar could fly, I'd, I'd, I'd want to poke at that in the same way. If somebody told me Jesus can walk on water, I think that's sort of worthy of some skepticism. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think it's fair, the principle of analogy and that skepticism, but I think there's a problem if we make it absolute. And so mm. here's an example to illustrate. If someone said, you know, I can't believe dinosaurs roamed the earth in the past because I've never seen di dinosaurs in my life. You know, that's using the principle anal of analogy. It's a fair, you know, it's a straightforward application of the idea. But anyone, if you, if you uh, say this objection to someone today, they're going to have this obvious question, which is, you know, what about them giant bones in the ground? You know, and so at the end of the day, you know, the principle of analogy can give us this hesitation. But if we use it as an excuse to not reckon with the data, then we're not actually being honest. And so that's kind of where we ended last time, which is we might have hesitation toward miracles, but we still have to reckon with this testimony. And it may be that it was a fraud. It may be that it was a misunderstanding, but we have to give an explanation to the data and try to come up with the most reasonable explanation. And so um, the principle of analogy is helpful, but it's it breaks down if you make it absolute, because then you can never believe things about the past if things are changing over time, over the course of the history of the universe. And they do. And they do. And, and the Christian claim is that God was doing something unique in Jesus that was really unparalleled since the creation of the universe. And so we should kind of expect that there were unique things happening there. Um, yeah, but still, there, there's this idea, there's this idea, and this is kind of where it all hangs on, is the idea of burden of proof. And burden of proof basically says, how much evidence do I need before I'll be convinced? And the, if someone says, you know, yesterday I went to the store, okay, plausibility, people go to the store all the time. Unless we have reason to doubt their, you know, that they're messing with us or there's some weird context, we're probably going to take it at face value and be like, okay, you went to the store. But if someone said, I went to the store yesterday and met Sasquatch, you know, the burden of proof is higher because that's not as plausible. And so I think the idea with the principle of analogy is when we, you know, there's the there's the statement, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I, that's actually not a good principle. It isn't consistent with statistics. What I what we can say, though, is extraordinary claims require more evidence. The burden of proof is higher. Mm -hmm. um, and so how much more evidence then becomes the question? That's an important distinction as well, because I mean, if, if you want to sort of hold that that analogy to be true, especially when, well, you choose how much evidence you need and what kind of evidence you need, it's a pretty way, it's a pretty easy way to just never believe anything you don't want to believe. Yeah, and so there's this place where, um, 
again, are you are you honestly looking at the data? Or are you looking for excuses? Um, and um, and you know, there's this other place too, um, which was kind of where I was, which is I wasn't looking for excuses not to believe, but I had genuine questions. I actually wanted to believe, but I couldn't believe if it wasn't reasonable. And so, you know, I think it's important. This is maybe a tangent, but it's important when you're talking to someone, you can kind of come in with a hammer and be like, well, you're just looking for excuses not to believe, but that can be devastating if someone is actually have honest questions. And so, you know, kind of had being spiritually sensitive and erring on the side of grace is always a good thing. Brilliant. All right. So how do we go about this? So, um, so one way, the, the traditional way, when you read a lot of apologetics books to deal with miracles is to say, okay, God exists, kind of like we did last time, therefore miracles are possible. And the most rational thing to do is to look at the evidence and to see if it can meet the burden of proof. And that's kind of the sequence. Um, and that's kind of what I've read everywhere, except for one professor. When I was at Taylor University as an undergrad, um, there was... I asked a number of professors, I was really struggling with how do I know any of this is real? And one day I got the bright idea. This is actually a great, great thing to do, actually. I highly recommend this exercise. I don't know why it just dawned on me in the middle of undergrad, but I decided, let me find some people who are convinced that this stuff is real and just ask them, rather than asking them my questions, which is important, let me ask what their reasons are, because maybe they have things that they're thinking about that I'm missing. And so I asked three professors, and the philosophy professor gave me philosophical reasons why well, belief in God makes sense. And I think you're talking to a philosopher or a pastor who's got philosophy background and that that was helpful. Um, maybe not what I needed, but it gave me perspective that I, I, I thought was helpful. I talked to a New Testament professor who was very well versed in um, the history of the New Testament and the critiques on it by uh, skeptical um, scholarship and all this. And he gave me historical reasons why the Bible makes sense to believe it. And, you know, this is, you know, pretty common. The third professor kind of took me for, he, he, he came at it out of left field. And it's something that kind of set this parallel course of research. As I was researching all this historical stuff, I started researching this other stuff. Because what he said um, was, you know, as I look at the supernatural world of the Bible and all the supernatural things that happened in it, that's the supernatural world we live in today because those things are happening all over today. So to me, it just makes sense to take it as is. And I was like, wait, what? Yeah. That's not, that's not the answer I was expecting. Yeah. And so, um, and so I kind of, he, in classes, he kind of talked about, um, you know, he would talk about uh, theology. This was a non-denominational college. So we talked about kind of comparative theology, charismatics, Calvinist, cessationist, continuist, all these different things and kind of the pros and cons. And so I got exposed to the arguments that the that the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. And I also got exposed to the case that they haven't. And the Lutheran position is that they haven't or that we have no reason to exclude them today. Um, but um I don't know if I knew that at the time, but I got exposed to all these things that were happening in charismatic circles. And, you know, we might critique some of their theology, but, you know, I think God's going to critique all of our theology one day. And I don't think he asks us to get our theology 100% before he'll bless us. And so I think there are things happening in certain circles that are genuine. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. But then I got to grad school and I'm doing my PhD and I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to do my homework and I need to see if there's actually scholarly stuff. Cause there's there, as we talked about, there's a bunch of sensationalism. So I said, you know, I need to see if there's legitimate sources that have documented this stuff carefully and that I, that's not like tabloid like oh my my dad died and went to heaven and came back and told me about my grandpa and there's no way to verify it but wow it really touched me you know right. that might be great but there's no way to verify it and so it could be a hoax for all we know and so that's that's what I started to do is say is there scholarly research on modern miracles that says the new the supernatural world of the New Testament is the same as the supernatural world that we may live in today. Right. That seems important question. So what'd you find out? So I found out, I was actually really surprised. So I have on my bookshelf here the first, the first installation. Um I emailed 
that professor when I was in grad school and I said, I asked him, are there scholarly resources that document this stuff? And he said, well, my friend Craig Keener, who's the scholar who's writing the book I'm about to show, is about to come out with the be all end all book on miracles. And if you look at it, um, it's two volumes. So you can see why he described it as the be all end all. He gets into the philosophy, the theology, the history of miracles. And then he spends a lot of time, probably half of this, um, documenting modern miracles on every continent. He also walks through all periods of history. He walks through miracles and other religions. And the thing that caught my attention when I bought it, because of course I bought it because I was curious, is um, like end notes. This much here is end notes on every page. Sometimes it's half a page of end notes. And this is two volumes and the back half of the second volume so a quarter of the pages of this is bibliography so i was like okay and he's a new testament scholar this book started because he wrote a footnote to a commentary on acts so it's an unrelated project and he said oh yeah miracles are still happening today so miracles and acts we should believe them and then someone was like wait you can't just say that you gotta pack it up and so this book came out and i started there and honestly it's a little bit it's a lot um <laughs> I haven't read through the whole thing, but I've read parts of it and I just started finding, okay, he's talking about, he, so, you know, when, we, when John the Baptist came to Jesus in the New Testament and said, I'm in prison, this isn't going as planned, are you really the Messiah? Yeah. Jesus quotes Old Testament prophecy and he says, go tell John what you've seen and heard, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, lepers are cleansed. Blessed is the one who's not offended by me. Exactly. And so apparently these things are happening today, which blew my mind. So blindness, he's got maybe 11 eyewitness accounts of blindness being healed within the span of two pages. Um, he, there apparently is pretty common for cataracts to be healed and for them to visibly disappear during the healing. So people's eyes will turn from white to gray to their normal color. And, you know, whole villages will convert because of these things. And so there were all these miracles that I only thought happened in the Bible. And here they are happening today all around the world. And really throughout Christian history, um, he goes through and talks about church fathers and the kinds of things that they said, um, Augustine, those kinds of things. Um, and he talks about doc doc doctor's notes. And do we have eyewitnesses that are credible? And um, all these different things. And I thought, okay, he's dealing with this at a scholarly level. And that really changed the game for me. So yeah, we're, we're not just sort of then like, like you, you call them tabloids. And I guess that's, that's sort of a fair way to, to talk about it. But at the same time, sort of recognizing that, I mean, even the best and the brightest of, of atheism would say there are things we cannot explain. And granted, they would say we cannot explain yet. Um, but, but for us, we simply recognize that there are things that God would do out of mercy in this creation that that seem to defy how things tend to work. Yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, we're running out of time, I think this time, but I think getting into some of the illustrations would be good. But there's even, there's another uh, professor at Indiana University um, that I found out about who studies these things um, using social sciences. Mm -hmm. And so she went, there's a couple who's a missionary in Mozambique and they apparently have a high success rate healing um, blindness and deafness, um, that they seem to have a special gifting of the spirit for that. And it's used to point people to the word of God and the gospel. And there, and there's a lot of cool things happening spiritually in Mozambique through these people. But this IU professor said, you know, we can use statistics to see if this is real. Cause one of the objections to miracles is, well, that's just a coincidence. Things have cancer goes into remission. Sometimes people sometimes wake up after being in a coma. So, you know, there's always the chance that this is a chance thing. And so the thing is statistics has the machinery to tell if something's a coincidence. And so they went to, they went to where these minute missionaries were working. They documented kind of how a typical prayer session goes. And then they, they did before and after they brought the scientific equipment to measure hearing and sight. And they did before and after, and they found statistically significant results. And I, yeah, I've, I, I can look up the exact quote, but it's actually pretty remarkable, some of the cases. And so, 
um, again, this isn't this isn't something where someone says, "Well, I heard it on on the news." You know, this is someone who said, "I want I want to measure it myself, and I want to subject it to the same scrutiny I would do in a lab." And that's kind of an interesting approach to take with the supernatural. But you know, that they they were able to document that, yeah, this stuff is happening and it's real. That's fantastic. I, and I mean, I, I kind of, like I said, I, I sort of go to war with myself over it because I believe that it can happen. I believe that it does happen even. Um, but there's this danger to sort of expect it to happen for me right now, because what, what God makes promises for are ultimately to drive us towards salvation. Um, and sometimes that includes miracles. And sometimes that includes only faithful preaching and, and the care of a community in a, in a normal way through vocations. And both are good and godly. Um, it's, it's sort of the devil's work inside of us to take two things that God gives us and always set them against each other. Um, and so we'll take then the, the normal ways that God would care and tend this creation, and we'll set them against the miracles and say, well, if God is working this way, he doesn't need miracles. Don't look for them at all. And in the same way, we'll also sort of said, well, if I found a miracle, I never want to look for something normal for God to work again. But inside of this, we can recognize that, well, all of this drives us towards faith. And so we can, we can, another way to sort of address the miracles are, are they accompanied by the pure teaching of the gospel? And yeah. if the gospel is being taught there, well, then maybe this is a part of it because it has been before. Um, and if there is no teaching of the gospel, then, well, it, it's, it might be something else or the gospel might be yet to come. But at the same time, um, in the same way, all the ways that God cares for us in this body and life through, through normal means of daily bread also still drive us toward, toward faith. And so the, the idea that these, these, these uh, miracles don't have to be set against modern life for us to sort of recognize and still test them is, it's an important thing for us to remember, especially as Lutherans. And we sort of, we, we get a little, we, we get like something stuck in our tooth every time somebody talks about miracles post Jesus and acts. Yeah, no, I think that that's huge. I think, uh, you know, the point of miracles isn't to like be like oh wow that's cool that was like a magic show <laughs> that was entertaining all right back to life you know right. god has a purpose in these and it's ultimately about a relationship with us that's why jesus came and even when he intervenes in our daily life through preaching through a friend talking to us or possibly through miraculous means it's all motivated out of his love for us and the fact that he wants a relationship with us. And sometimes, and this is a, you know, there are a lot of questions that are starting to come up as we're talking and they get into these in these books. I talk about, you know, what about the miracle that doesn't happen? You know, what happens when I pray for a miracle and someone else is healed and someone else suffers and dies? And it's really hard. Another question is, you know, if there are miracles, why should we seek medical treatment? Or if we seek medical treatment, why should we seek miracles? And these all kind of get into what's the heart, who, who, what is the heart of God? And at the end of the day, you know, the miracles are signposts. We talked about their signs pointing beyond themselves to who God is and the ultimate proof of God's character. And this is where it all comes down is the cross and empty tomb. You know, if you wonder, does God care when something bad happens? You know, I've had a pastor said that the, the ultimate proof that God cares is the cross. And if you wonder, is God capable of working? You know, the ultimate proof of God's capacity to work is the resurrection. And so everything points back to that. But, you know, the miracles are there. They have a role. And one of the roles is, I think, you know, because God's doing this today, we can have confidence that, okay, when we talk about burden of proof, the New Testament isn't like I went to the store and met Sasquatch right. at this point. If these things are happening today, it's like, well, someone got healed, but they, they're they reporting that around the world today. So the burden of proof comes down, and now we don't have to approach the Bible with this huge skepticism where how much evidence can we mount up before we believe it? Now we can maybe look at it a little more neutrally and say, okay, what does the evidence say? Is there something to support the Christian hypothesis about who Jesus was and what he did? Brilliant. David, this has been one of the more profound episodes we've done in a long time. So thank you very much for sharing this. This has me thinking and hopefully everybody out there too. Uh, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments below and uh, we'll do our best to respond to them in coming episodes. But uh, David, thanks so much for joining us in the Drive to School and giving us a lot to think about. Yeah, and uh, maybe sometime we can talk about some of the concrete stories because they're they're pretty cool. Um, I'd like to, yeah. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Have a good one. Okay, you too.